Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Keith St. Clair. I teach political science here at the, in the social science department at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, welcome, and we're excited to have our speaker, uh, Mr. Stephen uh, Tryon. Uh, he grew up in Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico. He graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1983. As a soldier, Steve served with the 10th Mountain Division, the 82nd Airborne Division, and the United Nations Command Joint Security Force Company in uh, South Korea. He earned a Master of Arts in Philosophy from Stanford University in 1992 and taught philosophy at West Point from 1992 to 1995. He also spent six years as a liaison to Congress, including a year as a fellow in the office of Senator Max Clayland, and a year as the legislative liaison for the Army's senior general. After a distinguished career in the Army, uh, Steve joined internet retailer Overstock.com, which uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the commercials on television for. Over a period of nine years on the Overstock.com executive team, Steve managed the company's logistics, human resources, international business, information technology, and facilities portfolios. He earned his Senior Professional of Human Resources certi Certification in 2012. And in response to public pessimism about the United States government, Steve published Accountability Citizenship and founded account accountabilitycitizenship.org in 2013. He resigned from Overstock.com last month to pursue his passion for improving government he lives in Salt Lake City, Utah, with his son Jake and dog Peanut. Uh, I had the pleasure of having dinner with him, and I know you're in for uh, an engaging talk. Um, he's told me about his um, recent uh, um, effort to pursue um, uh, uh, a congressional seat in Utah. He might reference that. And so uh, he's not only been involved in encouraging others to be active in government, he's obviously doing that himself. So if you would join me, I'd like to welcome uh, Stephen Tryon. Thank you. Thanks. thanks so much, and thanks for being here tonight. Uh, I know I'm keeping you away from March Madness, so I'll try to uh, provide some level of, of, uh, of entertainment uh, along with that. Uh, you'll see here, though, just to start off, first of all, we're going to talk a lot about the American dream tonight. That's not the title of my book. The title of my book is Accountability Citizenship. And, and, and the thrust of my book is that we have to change as citizens if we are to preserve the republic that we enjoy and, and the liberties that we enjoy. We have to change from being passive consumers of information and government to being active consumers of information and government. But I'm going to use the information dream as a way of, or excuse me, I'm going to use the American dream as a way of illustrating why that's the case. And when I think of the American dream, I'm reminded of a story of a, uh, uh, a convent. You know, and, and convent happened to run its, its own uh, dairy herd, uh, and the mother superior was on her deathbed. And so the sisters were all gathered around trying to comfort uh, the mother superior, and one of them had the idea of getting a glass of fresh milk went out and got the glass of fresh milk and brought it back in, and the mother superior turned it down. The sister, being persistent, remembered that there was a bottle of good Irish whiskey in the, in the pantry. And so she went out and put a, sh a stiff jigger of the Irish whiskey into the milk and brought it back in and offered it to the mother superior again. And the, the old nun took the, uh, the milk and sniffed it and then took a sip took a drink, and then finished off the glass of milk. And immediately the color rushed back into her face, and the sisters you know, were hopeful, and they, they, they sensed that something significant had happened, and this was an important moment. And they said, Mother Superior, do you have some wisdom that you can share with us now? And she looked at him and she said, don't sell that cow. And I think about that when I think of the American dream because the American dream is the cow we don't want to sell here in, in America. Uh, it, it's the, the 
framework, if you will, uh, for our society, for a lot of the positive behaviors that we want to encourage in our fellow citizens. And I believe it's the engine of our economy in many ways. This, uh, I, I've put the Michigan State flag up there, Tubor. Do any of you know what the word Tubor means? The phrase Tubor? We will defend. And, and in a very real sense, what we're talking about in terms of becoming engaged and becoming active, originally that was because Michigan was the frontier that, was, that became part of the, the flag. But uh, we, today we defend our liberties and our rights by participating, by registering to vote, and by doing some of the things we'll be talking about uh, as we go on. Now there's a lot of words on this slide, and really it's the, the bottom line up front, right? So that, that's, that's the bluff slide. I put it up front, but I've already told you what this is. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The, the bluff is, I believe we have to change. We have to change from being passive consumers of information in government to being active consumers of information in government. Because as passive consumers in today's society, with the way the information stream is structured today, it actually undermines uh, effective citizenship. It undermines some of the behaviors that we need to engage in uh, to protect the American dream. So here's a quick agenda. There's a great uh, story here to this slide, uh, but I'm not going to uh, go into the, the details of it. I just want to highlight the difference between want to and have to. You know, I've learned over and over again through my adult life, whether it, it was in the military or whether it was at, at Overstock.com in business, that there's a huge difference when you can tap in to the power of what people want to do. It's far more powerful to be able to engage what people want to do than it is to be able to have the authority to tell them what to do. And in a sense, again, that's what the American dream does for our society. It unleashes the potential of each and every one of us to go and pursue what we want to do. So we're more passionate about that. And that that's what really, it's the dilithium crystals for any of you, if there's any other uh, of my fellow uh, Star Trek nerds out there. But want to is important. So we, when we think about what the American dream is, we can find an intellectual framework of sorts for it in the Declaration of Independence. But when we think of the Declaration of Independence, it's very important that we remember that really was the product of several hundred years of evolution in uh, structures of government and social structures. You can go all the way back to 1100 in England. And King Henry signed something called the Charter of Liberties which was the first acknowledgment that there were some limits to what a king could do. And then over 100 years after that, the document that's more famous that we all learn about in school growing up, the Magna Carta, first time a document is forced on a king. Again, constricting what the king can do, the power of the king, and upholding, uh, uplifting the power of the law. And then over, over the centuries that follow, we have the evolution of a parliament system. We have the English Civil War. So by the time the colonists come to North America, just as a matter of course, they set up legislature, legislatures in the colonies to govern themselves. And so the Declaration of Independence and the words in the Declaration of Independence and that intellectual framework of the American dream, which I will, will say is, these words that are highlighted here that, that there are some ina unalienable rights, we'll talk about them as natural rights, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And not only, not only are there these natural rights, but that government's purpose is to secure those rights, and not just any which way, but to secure those rights in a way that's consistent with the will of the people. So I, we'll, we'll use that as sort of our intellectual framework, but what I want to do really is get past that to some stories of what the American dream looks like really in real people's lives. 
And I think that that's, that's very important. There's a footnote to that intellectual framework, right? And the footnote is that when the Declaration of Independence was signed, it was great if you were a white man. Didn't apply to African American slaves. Didn't apply to women. Didn't apply to the Native Americans that we were pushing out of, off their land as we expanded our society westward. And I don't say that because I want to create some massive cathartic guilt moment about what's happened in the past. I say that because it's very important that all of us acknowledge that fundamental hypocrisy that existed in our society, not just as a gesture towards the past, but because it, it opens our minds to the possibility that there are things we take for granted today as the right things that are equally wrong, that we're making those mistakes still today. So it's important for us to acknowledge that we had this, this framework, but we weren't implementing it the way we implement it today. We've gotten better over time with it. And it also is important, I think, because when we look at other countries that maybe aren't as far along in the development and evolution of their social structures, it helps us understand, accept, and negotiate with them to find solutions to the problems that we face together because we share the planet with seven billion other people and we have to work with them. This fella is a friend of mine. You can see if you do the math, 48 years ago, he posted this on, on uh, February 21st of this year. So if you do the math, he was inducted in the Army, drafted into the Army in 1966. That was three years after Martin Luther King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and told America, told the audience, I still have a dream deeply rooted in the American dream that this nation will rise up and live up to its creed that all men are created equal. King referenced in that speech that same intellectual framework that we were just talking about. And he also referenced the American dream. Larry joined the Army, went to Vietnam, came back, became a U.S. Army Ranger. 18 years into his Army career, I show up in my, at my first duty station in, in the Republic of Korea, and Larry is the senior non-commissioned officer in that unit, the, the, the first sergeant. I didn't call him Larry, I called him first sergeant. Uh, but um, he hel helped me tremendously uh, during that, that career. When he, when he retired from the Army as a command sergeant major with a senior enlisted rank, he went on to a second career uh, running security in the Pentagon, running security services in the Pentagon. He subsequently retired from that career, and so now he's uh, living in Maryland. I saw him a couple of months ago, and, uh, you know, grandkids. And, and, uh, but, but what I want you to, to, to think about is think about how the America that Larry Williams' grandchildren are growing up in are different, is different from the America that, that he grew up in. He grew up in an America where he didn't go to the same schools as the white kids and couldn't eat in the same part of the restaurants as the white kids. That was just, that was this guy. And then he went into the army and he served and our society has come so far in the last 55 years. We've evolved so much. And I guess what I would, what I, what I would close with, is I, on this slide anyways, is I would say that I think the American dream is about hope. It's about, and, and hope I would say is uh, a positive expectation of some future benefit or positive anticipation of some future good 
that you're going to be able to reap the benefits in the future of the, of the positive behaviors you engage in today. You're here at Grand Rapids Community College. You're going to get a degree, and that degree is going to help you get a better paying job in the future because we know that college graduates on average in the United States earn something like $17,000 a year more than people who don't have college degrees, right? So that's hope. And, and I think the, the hope is a fundamental element of the American dream. And we'll come back to that uh, as we go along. Now let's turn the clock back a little bit and think about what did the American dream look like in 1800? You know, in the early part of the 19th century as, as the country expanded westward. Well, Americans in those days had a choice. They could stay and engage in those positive behaviors that we were talking about in the hope that they could build a better future for themselves where they were. Or there was all this land that we were buying from other Europeans uh, who had claimed it, right? And, and, and we were occupying essentially and annexing from the Native Americans as we moved westward across the country. So you have the, the, the Northwest Territory expansion, and then you've got the Louisiana Purchase. And, and the thing that I think is sort of paradigmatic as an example, and it was brought out in a movie that, was, uh, that, that came out in the early 1990s called Far and Away. Has anybody seen that movie, Far and Away? It's a terrific movie, Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, the uh, Irish immigrants come into America. It's, it's this, all this American dream stuff that I'm talking about, but it's done the Hollywood way. Uh, and and they, they get you to 1893 in Oklahoma, and, and, you're, and you, they set you up for the Oklahoma land rush. And literally, settlers, people were allowed to come out there and line up and at high noon on April 22nd, 1889, they sounded a, a gun and there was a race. And people could move out and stake a claim to land. And if they stayed and worked that land and they made it successful, they would, they would get the title to 160 acres of land. So I mean, that, that's, I think, a, a when people think about the American dream, at least in history, I think, I know in my mind, that's one of the, the examples that always comes up is the ability to go out and stake a claim to some land and work it with your sweat and, and blood and, and make it something of your own. And then you have that as your, as your uh, uh, something that you can own and pass on to your, to your posterity. But that's not the American dream that we have today. We're not giving away 160 acre parcels of land today. Does anybody know the story of Jean Combe, the Ukrainian immigrant here? Jean and his family, after the wall came down, the, the Berlin Wall came down and, and uh, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, uh, John and his family came from the Ukraine into the United States. And when they got to the United States, they, were, they, were, they went through some tough times. They were on food stamps. The family was on food stamps in California. Well, Jean was here with part of his family, and he was trying to communicate with his family back in Russia. And so he worked on some messaging technologies to help him do that. Turns out he turned that into a business idea. He co-founded a company called WhatsApp. And you guys know the story now, right? $19 billion that Facebook paid for WhatsApp about two weeks ago. So that's not bad for 20 years. You know, that's not a bad American dream story. So lightning still strikes, right? And in my book, I talk about some other examples of rags to riches stories. We can see these kind of rags to riches story. Howard Schultz starting off in sort of the, the uh, gritty streets of New York and rising to be the CEO of Starbucks, right? So we find those kinds of stories. If you've seen the movie, uh, uh, the, the movie about uh, the Apple, 
uh, co-founder. Help me out. Who's that? Who's who am I thinking of? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. She, the movie Jobs that just that was just out here earlier this year. That's another one where he started building that business in his garage, right? So, lightning strikes, and, and that's more the dream as we envision it today, as we see it today. But remember. what we said about hope. This book by Jeff Colvin, which I cite in, in my book, you know, when we think about lightning striking, sometimes we think about, well, that happens to other people. And when we think about people who are really smart, we think about somebody like Jean Colm, we think, yeah, okay, there's a guy who was born with, you know, the ability to, like, conceive zeros and ones in his, in his sleep. You know, he's some techno genius guy who's going to be able to write this code for this uh, messaging app. That's not me. Well, Colvin, in, the, in this book, Talent is Overrated, goes back to a whole bunch historically of people that you might think are prodigies like that. Mozart. says We think Mozart was just born a genius because he started composing at a very young age. Well, when you really look at the history of it, it turns out his father was a composer. And he started him working on music at a very young age. And he worked hours and hours and hours on music. So Colvin's hypothesis is there's no, there are no natural geniuses. What we have are case after case of the people where we think they're natural geniuses. But in fact, what you find is there are people who have put in thousands of hours of work, focused work, what he calls deliberate practice to build the skills that they later make look, make look so effortless, right? It makes it look like they're these natural geniuses that are the best dancers in the world, the best chess players in the world. They're these people who have actually put insane amount of time working to build that skills. So why, how does that relate to the American dream? Well, it, it creates the possibility that the American dream is really a self-fulfilling prophecy that you've got this, this society now, you know, for, for uh, where we have the, the hope, the positive expectation of being able to earn the fruits of our labor without regard to the color of our skin, without regard to where we go to church or whether we go to church, without regard to where our parents came from. We have the hope here that we'll be able to enjoy the fruits of our positive behaviors and, and work. And what Colvin says is that if, if we put work into something and, deliberate, and, we, and we practice the right things, that can make us an expert. That can make us a Jean Combe in our field. So it creates the possibility that the American dream is a self-fulfilling, there's hope, and hope motivates work. And then the work, in turn, makes the hope and the dream a reality. So there's, there's this very strong uh, correlation or mechanism that we can go to. So um, why is the dream important? What is it about the American dream? Uh, you know, we talk about the, uh, uh, we talk about the land rush, and we talk about, uh, you know, the ability to have this hope and, and uh, the John Combs story and the way the American dream happens today. Um, why is that important? If, if the American dream gives us hope, what is it like in a society where there isn't that kind of hope? If, if it's the ability to, to hope that you're going to get positive benefits from your hard work, if that makes your life meaningful, what is it like to live in a society where you don't have that hope? Is your life, maybe, does it feel meaningless if you don't have that hope? And if that's the case, What are the implications of that? 
Hamilton, you, you know, we, we talked about uh, the, the intellectual framework of the American dream as this natural rights argument, that human beings are just naturally the, come with these rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or at least the inclination. We're fulfilled as human beings when we live in societies where it's possible for us to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So think. Has anybody ever heard of this fellow, Vasily Matusak? I'd be shocked if anybody's heard of Vasily Matusak. Vasily Matusak was a Soviet citizen. In 1984, he defected from North Korea into South Korea at the, in the demilitarized zone. And when he defected, a big fight happened right where, right where he ran across the line. And several North Korean soldiers were killed and wounded. An American soldier was wounded and a South Korean soldier was killed. When, the, when he ran across the line, the United Nations Command deployed a quick reaction force in because there was a fight going on. I was the quick reaction force platoon leader. I was the first person to get to Vasily Matusak on our, when he was on our side of the line. We didn't know, I didn't know he was a Soviet citizen at that time. I searched him. I found his passport. Passport had a big red hammer and sickle on it, which if you, if you grew up in my year group, that was sort of the emblem of the Soviet Union, right? The, the communist other that we, that we were opposed to there on the, on the demilitarized zone. What I remember is, I remember that Matusak was scared. And I, you know, I found out that he, he got that because there were North Koreans that, that were chasing him and they were shooting and there were people that were, that were being, he was scared. But the other thing that occurred to me and I thought of afterwards is that when he got up that morning, I mean, he, he planned this out. This wasn't something that he did impulsively. He brought film with him. He, had, he planned this out. So he got up that morning, and he knew that he was going to make this dash, and he was going to risk his life for what? Why? Maybe because he was living in a society where he didn't have that hope, where he, his life maybe felt less meaningful than he wanted it to feel. And maybe when, you, when your life is not as valuable as you think it should be or could be, you're willing to risk it in order to get something better. This is just a couple of pictures of, of the fight. This young man is willing to risk his life in 1989 standing in front of four Chinese tanks uh, right outside of Tiananmen Square. The same kind of thing. The same kind of thing. Somebody trying to change their society because they're aware that there are societies now that where people have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they're aware of sort of a cognitive dissonance between that and what they're experiencing in their, own, in their own circumstance. And they're trying to change it. And they're willing to risk their life to do that. The Arab Spring, same thing. It's a 26-year-old fruit vendor in Tunisia, in the upper left-hand corner there. He was the sole provider for his family. Do you guys know the story of how the Arab Spring started? Sole provider for his mother and his six siblings selling fruit in a stand. And he shows up at the place where he's been selling fruit for years. And the police come, and they fine him because he doesn't have the right kind of a permit. And they've done that before. But this time, the police are having a really bad day. And so they're a little bit abusive to him. And they actually they take his stand. So now he's been publicly humiliated, and he's lost his fruit. He's lost the only thing he has that allows him to provide for his family. So Mohammed Boazizi, this 26-year-old young man, goes, pours gasoline on himself and lights himself on fire in front of a government building in Tunisia. That's what sparks the riots 
that bring down the Tunisian government. And then you see the political cartoon there in the middle. Yeah, that spreads. It spreads to Egypt and eventually brings down the Mubarak regime. It spreads throughout the, the, the Arab world. You see it in the Syrian civil war, people risking their lives. You see it just recently in Kiev. So, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we're taking baby steps. We're carving laws onto clay tablets. We're making kings sign pieces of paper until here, and then maybe a few other places, social systems emerge that enable human potential in a new way. And then where that potential, where those social systems don't exist, but where people are able to have access to the realization that it can exist, now that's not OK. Now that they have this realization that life can be so much more meaningful and where I am, it's not. And so they're willing to risk their lives. And what you, have, what you find is the societies that don't have a recognition or an enablement of that human potential and human fulfillment become unstable. Right after the land rush that we were talking about in 1889, this fellow was born in China. And he said, he said that political power came out of the barrel of a gun. I just realized that I have some sound effects in with these uh, slides, so that's going to, so that, that might disrupt things a little bit more. But, so, so, uh, but what Mao said was political power comes from the bar grows from the barrel of a gun. That's not what we've been talking about. Right? How can that be? How can we reconcile that with what Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence? These are two diametrically opposed things, right? We got any Hegelian geeks in here? Any, any philosopher kings and queens? You know, the, the dialectic, when you've got a thesis and an antithesis, What's the, th what's the synthesis here? How can we reconcile these things? Is one of them wrong? Well, you know, I, I ran Overstock's international business for a while. And I did a lot of business in China. I worked with a lot of Chinese businessmen. I was actually able to talk to them about the American government, because they were sending large groups of students to the University of Utah, and I actually got to teach and talk to them about how American businesses run and how the, the American government interacts with American businesses. Um, and and it, I became really interested in trying to reconcile this, this view of Mao Zedong and the view of Thomas Jefferson on how can it be? That, what's, what's the solution? And what I what I started playing with was, well, like every good synthesis, let's make a spectrum. Let's say neither, it's not that one of them's right and one of them's wrong. Let's say that both of them are right. And how can that be? Well, think about what Mao, Mao born in uh, 1893, as the Qing dynasty is sort of falling down around his ears, right? The Western powers are coming into China, and they're carving out, they're, they're exploiting uh, for economic advantage pieces of China. And then in 1898, the Boxer Rebellion, the Chinese push back on that, and there's all this violence. And eight nations come in, eight Western nations come in, and they defeat the Chinese, and, and they impose harsh sanctions. The Qing, that, that doesn't do a whole lot for the Qing dynasty, and, and so eventually that just collapses. And you've got, for one brief shining moment, the Chinese Republic in 1911 under Sun Yat-sen. That lasts a couple of years until one, a former Qing general seizes power back, and, and the country descends back into warlordism and violence. So my point is, Mao sees violence as 
the source of political power throughout his childhood into his young adulthood. He joins the Chinese Communist Party and he's fighting against the Japanese invasion. And it's not until he pushes the nationalists off the mainland to Taiwan that he's able to kind of stop fighting. He's fighting his entire adult life until 1949 when the Chinese Civil War ends. Jefferson, on the other hand, is born in Virginia. He's the son of somebody who owns a lot of land. He inherits 5,000 acres of land. He goes to, to law school at William and Mary. Not long after that, he goes into the House of Burgesses, which is one of those colonial legislatures that's been set up there to, to govern the colonies. So his whole experience growing up is within this long tradition that we were talking about where people get to govern themselves and the consent of the governed. So they both really are reflecting on their experiences. And oh, by the way, Jefferson's society, America, isn't immune to the Civil War thing, right? Because we had our own experience with that. Less than 100 years after we started out, we had the American Civil War pop up. So our society can slide back into that, that end of the spectrum. And the Chinese, just here recently, they just had this example where they took a major political figure, Bo Lai, and they put him through a, a trial by jury, something like a Western uh, procedure. I mean, you can critique how much like a Western procedure or, or a procedure of, of social justice, but they basically took a major political figure and put him through a, a process of procedural justice and found him guilty. And, and so much, it's not the case that, that, that uh, they solve everything with the power of a gun. Lebanon, I throw up there just as an example of a society that just completely disintegrated in 1975. And even though they, they came out of that civil war around 1990, it's still very much a society where armed factions control different places at different times. And then the US 2000 presidential election, I think, is an absolute amazing highlight where you have a transition from one political party to another political party. And it's contested. And, it, and we, have, we have to go to like the third tie-breaking procedure before we finally get a, a, a decision. And we don't have, it's not the case that Democratic governors mobilize Democratic National Guards and Republican governors mobilize. We don't even think about doing that in America. We just accepted the outcome of the procedure. We might have, we might have grumbled about it or whatever, but we followed a set of procedures, and, and the outcome was the outcome. And we said, eh, that's, that's the way we said we were going to decide these kind of things. So it's kind of, a, 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 I think, a very great example of, of how good it can be on the cooperative end of the spectrum uh, in terms of resolving disagreements. But the really interesting thing about this spectrum isn't the examples at the left end and the, and the examples at the right end, in my mind. It's where's the tipping point? And what are the warning signs around the tipping point? Does anybody know what happened on December 16th, 1773? Collective civil disobedience. We're going to destroy some stuff. We're going to mess up some tea. OK, we're going to throw it in the harbor, right? Not only that, we'll dress up like Native Americans when we do it. So we're going to have the Boston Tea Party, OK? Well, that's, you know, okay, we're kind of coloring outside the lines there. Playing, we're, we're, we're breaking the rules. But then on September 5th, we go and we, we bring together a whole bunch of representatives in the first, colonial con the first Continental Congress, and we actually create a petition. We go back now to that tradition of trying to solve things through the process. We make a petition, and we send it to the King of England, and we say, we don't like some of the stuff you're doing. Stop it. And the king ignores us, right? Just completely blows us off. And so then you got colonial militia, British soldiers, Lexington and Concord, and we've got ourselves a revolutionary war. So that's one example of 
a constellation of events around that tipping point. And, and that's interesting. You know, I was talking to uh, Colonel Gillum earlier today about his experience in the Army. And he's got some experience in that regard, too. We think, well, gee, that's hundreds of years ago, the American Revolution, right? It can't happen today. But Colonel Gillum has some experience with that, where it, ha it did happen. During that time of social upheaval in the United States, when we were transforming our society in the 1960s, it did happen here. We did have riots in major American cities, and there was violence. So it's not the case that we're immune uh, to, to, that, to the circumstance here. Now, it's time for a story. And this is not a story I'm going to tell with a, with a slide. This is a story I'm going to, you know, that spectrum we've been talking about at the, the level of society. And that's great. But remember, when we talked about the American dream, we brought it down. And, and I gave you some snapshots of Larry Williams and, this, and John Combe. And we, this is what the American dream looks like in some real American lives. Well, what do you think this spectrum looks like in some real American lives? Let me tell you the story. When I first took over logistics operations for Overstock, I, the warehouse was processing you know, about half the company's business. And uh, in the course of a year and a half or so, we just radically transformed the processes and, and the people. And we did, some we did some, one of the most rewarding things professionally I've ever done. We cut labor costs in half, literally. Increased uh, pr productivity tremendously. Uh, it was a fantastic, a fantastic period of time uh, for, the, for that business. And one of the people, I had great people working for me, and that's what made it happen. And one of the, the people was a young woman named Vanessa Antrobus Quinn. And Vanessa was from a working class family in Cincinnati. She was, I think, the second oldest girl in a family of five. The first person in her family to go to college. She went to the University of Cincinnati on a soccer scholarship. She was absolutely beautiful. Fiery red hair, just equally fiery disposition. And man, she could make that shipping operation snap, crackle, and pop. Well, by the end of 2006, because of the success that we'd had, I was actually able to pay everybody in the warehouse a bonus for the first time ever. And Vanessa got a nice bonus based on her salary. Uh, and, and Vanessa, you know, a little bit more of her backstory. She had come out from Cincinnati to Utah in 2002. She met a guy in Cincinnati, and they decided to come out and stay away from the guys that lead you astray all the time. But the guy she met was going to come out to Utah to work for the Olympics. And so Vanessa came out uh, with him. They both worked for the Olympics after the Olympics. Uh, they found jobs in the area. They decided they were going to stay. She came to work for Overstock. He went to work for another company called Hilti. And, uh, you know, they, they got married. So a uh, great story. Uh, but Vanessa got her bonus uh, in 2006 and went back to buy a wedding ring. They, they decided they were going to go buy a wedding ring, you know, her and Rich. Uh, and that was great. Uh, and, and so she got her bonus, and she went uh, to the jewelry store and was waiting for Rich to show up. And a young man named Suleiman Talovic, a Bosnian immigrant who had come to the United States when he was 10, dropped out of high school when he was 16, a young 19-year-old immigrant, walked into that mall with a shotgun and a handgun, killed five people, wounded four, before he was killed by the Salt Lake City SWAT team. And uh, one of the people that he killed was Vanessa. That spectrum between hope and violence at the individual level, I think I've seen it in two very real human lives of people that, I've, that I know. I, I, I know I saw it in Vanessa's life. It ended her life. Her, she was full of hope. She was the American dream personified. She was rocking. She was on her way. 
and from everything that I've been able to piece together about Mr. Tolovic, and I don't offer any excuses for him or for what he did, but, but everything that I can piece together about his experience is he got put into this society and he never really kind of fit. It just never kind of worked. He was probably the kid that other kids picked on because he didn't speak English real well or whatever. And so he dropped out of school early and uh, it just didn't work for him here. And so the American dream wasn't happening. It wasn't hope. It wasn't, he, he didn't have that hope. So what happens now? Life is meaningless. And so, hey, now we've got this collision between somebody who's hopeless and somebody who's got it all. And that's what happens if we don't take care of the American dream. Okay, that's, what ha that's why it's important that we pay attention to making sure that, not that we give people everything, but that we certainly give them a system where they have the an positive anticipation of being able to reap the fruits of their labor in the future, right? So now, do we have that system? There's a great study that was published in January on intergenerational mobility. That's, that's a mouthful, intergenerational mobility. Okay, so what that says is it, it, it looked at tax data and it was focused on, because of the, the data that it was using, it was focused on children of the 70s and 80s. And it matched them up to their parents. And it said, how many of these children whose parents were in the bottom economic tier could expect to rise to the top economic tier? And essentially it said, there was no change between the children, of the, the cohort of the 70s children and the cohort of the 80s children. So the conclusion of that report that was published in January is that eh, it looked like, from, for that snapshot, it looked like economic mobility was, or intergenerational mobility was flat. However, the level of inequality between the bottom tier and the top tier in the society is getting larger during that time period. And the consequences of the birth lottery are increasing. What does that mean? Well, on average, the chance of moving from the bottom economic quintile, the bottom fifth to the top, was about 9% in, in this study, in both this, the children of the 70s and children of the 80s. But if you look at that based on geography, if you were born in some places of the southeastern United States, your chances of moving from the bottom quintile to the top were about 4%. And if you were born in some places in the West, your chances of moving from the bottom to the top were actually around 12%. So that's, you know, that lottery of where are you born and where in the economic spectrum are you born because now the gaps are getting bigger. That's what was referred to by the consequences of the birth lottery being, being uh, increasing. The, the uh, authors of the study use a great picture. They, they use this, uh, this uh, example of the, the fellow on the left shows, yeah, he's still moving at the same rate between the 70s and the 80s, but the, the, the difference is on the right, the rungs, the, the distance between the rungs of the ladder are actually growing or actually increasing. Now there's another study. And this is the study because, I mean, if you think about it, it's great that we looked at the children in the 70s and the 80s and we say, okay, it's flat for those two. But Suleiman Tolovic wasn't a children. He wasn't a child of the 70s. He wasn't a child of the 80s. He was like more than the 90s and the zero zeros, right? So what, what do we think about what's happening for, for those people? And what we don't have the same data that we used or that was used in the study uh, for the kids of the 70s and the 80s. We don't have that data yet, but they do have some other indicators that they've looked at, and those other indicators that they looked at are not encouraging. They say that they're projecting that the, the rate of mobility between the bottom quintile and the top quintile is going to, quote unquote, plunge dramatically, and that's bad. So, that brings me to my book, 
And what is it that we can do about that? What is it that we can do to affect uh, the level of, of intergenerational social mobility? Well, I would say that we have to make sure, again, I'm not, I'm not up here saying that we need to take a bunch of money from any group of Americans and give it to any other group of Americans. That's not the point. The point is to create processes, structures, and systems that are fair, that create a level playing field, and then we let the social systems take care of uh, the intergenerational mobility stuff, right? I mean, that's, that's what the American dream was and, and is for people like John Combe and people like Howard Schultz. It's just, just give them a, a level playing field and make sure that we're, not, that we're not disenfranchising them economically or politically, or politically, that we're giving them an equal playing field. And, Americans historically have sort of been, and, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to show here with these people kind of looking in all different directions and they're all doing their own thing, is we've always been that passive consumer of information and government. And it's been kind of okay. Back in the 18th century, how did we get our news? Well, somebody rode into town and, and, and read us a newspaper that they brought with them, or we got letters, uh, or there was a, uh, town crier that, that, would, uh, that we would listen to it was one of the reasons uh, why people in, in some of the early colonies it was mandatory that people go to church because that was where they would disseminate news. They would read these proclamations. Well, that's not the way we get our information today. Today we, we've ha had a deregulation of cable TV, deregulation of radio. Uh, our newspapers are now... Uh, uh, you know, not only uh, paper, but also in the, on the internet. We get tweets, we got blogs, we got Instagrams. We have information coming at us on billboards. From the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night, we're bombarded with information, okay? And if we, I mean, we can do this. We can just mind our own business and do our, point our own direction and let the information hit us. But the information that hits you isn't as random as it may appear. It's targeted to you based on what kind of clothes you buy, what kind of car you drive, what kind of job you have. All the little pieces of data that are out there about you are being used to sort of market stuff to you, including information. Because the businesses that are, mark that are selling information, that are, that are packaging news, they're, trying, they, they're businesses. And they're trying to make money. And they get money by attracting people to click on their links, people to buy their newspapers, people to listen, watch. And they, they get that by, pack, by using consumer psychology and information marketing. And when they use consumer psychology and information marketing, the messages tend to coalesce around the five, what I call the five myths. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a conspiracy. It's not that there's evil communications consortiums out there that are trying, they're not doing, they're trying to make money. That's what businesses do. They're trying to figure out how to, how to get more people to, to look at their stuff. And so they package stuff a certain way. The problem isn't with the information stream. The problem is that if we're just passively consuming it, we're gonna get fed conspiracy stories when they're really when, when the conspiracy story is really just a better way to sell the story. It's not necessarily the most accurate depiction of the constellation of events that have happened. And so if we absorb those myths, if we absorb those myths passively over time, that's where I say we're, our, our Practices of effective citizenship are essentially being discouraged by the fact that we absorb these myths. We all just kind of throw up our hands and say, ah, I don't want to, I don't even want to participate. Those darn Republicans or those darn Democrats or, uh, you know, things are just hopeless. It's gridlock, it's polarization and whatever. So it gets to the point where it, it frustrates us 
and it discourages effective citizenship. So now let's go back to that discussion of uh, wealth. You know, we talked about intergenerational mobility between the bottom quintile and the top quintile. So I thought, well, let's draw some quintiles, right? So I just drew this, this little set of bands, and, and I, I wanted to sort of think about uh, what might be differences in behaviors from people in the bottom quintile and people in the top quintile. How many people think that more of the people in the top quintile had somebody else do their taxes for them than people in the bottom quintile? I think that. Right? They got more disposable, more, they got more money to pay somebody else to do it for them. How many people think that uh, more people in the top quintile than in the bottom quintile wrote letters to their congressmen? I would, I think that that's at least a possibility. I, I'm not for so sure about that one but I think it's at least a possibility that they have more time and they're more engaged in the political process. Now, how about this one? How many people think that the people in the top quintile, now this is, this is, a, this is a dead giveaway. If you don't answer this one, you're not paying attention, okay? How many people think that more people in the top quintile make political contributions to their favorite candidate than people in the bottom quintile? Absolutely, right? People in the bottom quintile don't have that disposable income. People in the top quintile do, right? So there's some differences in behavior that we can think about. Well, now let's take those quintiles and let's, and I don't know that I have the colors right, okay? I'm an independent, uh, so I'm not sure that I've got the colors line. I know de generally we say Democrats are on the left and Republicans are on the right, but I'm not sure if I got the reds and the blues right, so that's not really important. But let's, let's look at w different kinds of political alignment along the sort of the x-axis while we're looking at the level of wealth along the y-axis. And the interesting thing here is, well, we can imagine that over on the left, we're going to have a bunch of people who are, you know, very supportive of the Affordable Care Act. And then way over on the right, we're going to have a bunch of people who are very opposed to Obamacare. And some number of those people aren't going to realize that it's the same legislation. But what's really interesting is not, for me anyways, what's really interesting is not so much where, you know, just like that spectrum that we were talking about a while ago, it's not the examples that are on the far left and the far right, but where, what are the points of consensus now, given what we said about behaviors, what do you think in the top quintile, what do you think in the middle that all those people, whether they're reds or blues or pinks or light blues, what do you think, do you think they, they're more likely to agree on a change to the tax structure that reduces the tax on stock dividends? Then, then maybe it's a change to the tax structure that we're talking about. And these are the people that we kind of sort of said, well, the people in the top are more likely to have somebody do their taxes for them. And they're probably more postured to take advantage of certain kinds of uh, uh, tax loopholes, tax benefits. I would say maybe you might find some agreement uh, on, on specific items of tax, of the tax system that allowed them to keep or exclude some, some of that income from taxation. What about uh, 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 rules that would allow them to donate more of their money to the political candidate of their choice or to support the issues that they think are important? Do you think, w would there be a, would there be a a zone of consensus there in the top, more so than lower down. You might, you might have some disagreement 
at, in the top quintile as well. But I'll bet you you have more agreement in the top quintile than in the bottom quintile on something like that. So it's interesting to think about that. And it's interesting to think about that. And I'm not a government basher because I worked in government for a long time. Um, but a government, our government, is a large organization. And large organizations have certain inertias. And our government has those inertias too. And that's not saying it's better or worse than any other system out there. It's just saying that you got to understand that in a large organization, you understand what the inertias are. And one of the inertias of government is that you've got the costs of government that are distributed among all of the people who pay taxes, right? That's represented by those people with the money bags up there. And then as it gets processed through the mechanisms of government, those distributed costs are transformed into a lot of different things. But one of the products is a concentrated benefit. You've got some set of concentrated benefits that gets produced as a result of government action, legislation, Supreme Court decisions, you, call, you, you name it, right? There are concentrated benefits that are produced as a result of government action. And who do you think is more able to affect that inertia? Who do you think is more able to target where those concentrated benefits go? Just naturally. People in the top quintile or people in the bottom quintile? My, my argument would be that it's more likely the people in the top quintile who are able to do that. So if you just let it drift, the inertia of government is going to create something like what those studies of intergenerational mobility say is happening. The top is going to start moving further away from the bottom. And if that happens, then at some point, my the American dream may be at risk. The American dream may be at risk. And if the American dream is at risk, and if there is this spectrum between hope and hopeless that I talked about, then that's a threat to our republic. And that's the argument for getting involved. Because the solution to this is not changing a system of government. It's changing the way we behave as individual citizens. It's caring enough to make sure that we're registered to vote and making sure that our neighbor knows it's not cool to not be registered to vote. It's cool to register to vote and to participate and to make sure that when there are when there are congressional elections and, and congressional primaries and all the, the many things that, that we have to do as citizens, that we do our part. And so the argument in accountability citizenship basically attacks this from a few slides back where we talked about being passive consumers of information in government and those people were all just kind of looking in their own directions. That's, that's where the argument of my book specifically is be appropriately positive, which means don't be passive. Be active. I'm not trying to tell you what your values should be. I'm just telling you you got values. Write them down. Figure out what they are and go get information about those values, the things that are most important to you, that you think are the most important for our society. And don't just get the information that makes you feel good. Because remember what I said. If you're passive, the information that comes to you is probably going to make you feel good. If you're a Fox News person, you're probably going to start getting a lot of Fox News kind of stuff coming at you because it's being targeted. Not because it's a conspiracy, just because that's the way the business works. That's the way they sell more. So 
Step outside of your comfort zone. Figure out what your values are and then go get the information, not just the information that makes you feel good about your values, but understand the other side's view, the people who don't think the same way that you do. Challenge yourself to understand why they don't think the same way you do. It's fine if at the end of that process you say, eh, I still think I'm right. That's okay. You're going to be far more intellectually prepared to defend your position in a rational way without resorting to, a, oh, well, that's just stupid. Oh, well, that's just evil. You know, if you've gone out and you've actually tried to understand, because in most cases, there's a perfectly reasonable way to get to that other position. Might not be a whole lot of, of stuff that you agree with, but there's a, personal, a perfectly reasonable way to get there. And understanding the points of difference will help you be articulate and will help you be respectful of those human beings on the other side of, of the issue. So positively, appropriately positive, appropriately informed. And then the last thing is appropriately engaged. And appropriately engaged just means talk to your members of Congress. Talk to your elected representatives. Go, go get face to face and eyeball to eyeball with them. Email them, text them, Twitter them, however is the best way for you to communicate with them. And it's not okay if you don't get a response back. They are public servants, your elected officials. And that means when you provide them input, you should expect a response. And it's not okay for them to say, oh, I'm too busy. They're not royalty. They're not King George. We had that, that part of the spectrum we put behind us a couple of hundred years ago, right? They have to answer to you. So make them answer to you. Hold them accountable. How many of you have jobs outside of school? And you have performance appraisals. People give you report cards on those jobs where you get checked off on, you, know, you, did, you made sure that the, the, the food was at the right temperature during your shift and all that kind of stuff, right? You get checked off on that stuff. Well, we should have the same kind of a check sheet for our elected representatives. And that's, as again, I, I ran human resources for overstock.com, so I ran the performance management, I built the performance management system for that company. And you can build a performance management system for your member of Congress based on your values. What's important for you that that member of Congress do? And then scorecard it and figure it out. Figure out what he's done in the last two years or what she's done in the last two years. And then hold them accountable. Communicate to them. Let them know that, that you either are happy or are not happy with what they've done. And then vote. And that's the kicker, is you got to make sure that you have a choice. Because <laughs> in a lot of cases, if you're passive, and here we are in March, I know in Utah, the caucuses are done. Today's the, today's the day. For the, for the Republican caucus and the caucuses for the Democrats. Are, if, you don't, if you're not filed as a candidate today in Utah, for, can, for Congress anyways, you can't be, can't, you can't be a, a candidate for Congress. So if people have been passive to this point, there's a chance that you're going to go find out, gee, who's running? I'm not really happy with my person in Congress. Who's running against them? There's a chance you're going to find out, uh, there's nobody running against them. I don't have a choice. My choice is either to not vote or to vote for that person that I don't really like. Well, that's not, that's not the way America is supposed to work. So we have to be involved enough to make sure not just that we're going to the polls and that we're registered, but we have to make sure that we're paying attention and that there's going to be somebody to vote for. There's going to be a horse race because in over 400 of the districts uh, of our House of Representatives now, essentially, it's, they're one-party districts. Essentially, one-party districts. So we need to make sure we engage people uh, in, in the middle because that one-party district thing is kind of interesting. It's based on who's been voting. So that's the bad news, is that it's, there's one-party districts. There's a lot of one-party districts out there. The good news is 
not a lot of us that have been voting. There's, there's been a very small percentage of people voting. I'm not sure I said that exactly right. I might want to go back and edit the tape. But my point is that it, it's kind of good news because if we go out and we get all of our friends and neighbors to go register and vote, then the way they've drawn the lines so that it's one party district, that's going to kind of be irrelevant because you're going to bring in a whole bunch of new people that are unknown factors. And, 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 and it's going to be a horse race again. And so that's why at, at, the, at the very end, the very bottom line of my book, at the beginning of my book, and then at the end of my book, I say, vote. It's all about getting people to participate and to vote and to go out and vote. And that's how we preserve the American dream. And that's how we protect the liberties that we have and that we want our children to have in the future. Uh, that, that's how we make that happen. It doesn't, it's not something that happens in Washington. It's not something that the, your, your political science instructor is going to take care of for you. It's something that we all have to do. We all have to do our part. It won't work otherwise. So that's my message. And uh, in Utah, the good news in my district is there's going to be a horse race. Because I figured out early enough that the person that I wasn't happy with was going to run unopposed, and I got registered. So I'm going to run for Congress in my district. That's why I'm running. OK, I'm not going to spend a ton of money. I, I'm, you know, but I'm going to run. And there'll be another name on the ballot. And I can get my message out, and I can get out why I'm uh, not happy with the person I'm running against. I can put out a value proposition for how I can differentiate myself from that person. And every one of you can do the same thing. 87% of Congress comes up for re-election every two years. And something like 85 to 90% of Americans say they disapprove of the job that Congress is doing. Those two things don't make sense. They point to the fact that we've got this huge engagement problem. And we need, you, you're generating this. We need to fix this. All of us need to fix it. Not something your parents can fix. Not something somebody else is going to fix for you. We got to do it all together. You got to do your part. And that's it. Step down off my soapbox. So that's, uh, I guess we just, I, I just spent a bunch of time talking about all that. Should we open up to questions for the audience? Great. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, appropriately informed. Yeah. What other question? Excuse me, if you could speak into the mic for the recording. Um, I guess it's not necessarily just a question about a comment. You talk about the top and the bottom and the disparity between the two, um, and you talk about entitlements. And, you know, from my perspective, and even though I may be in the lower um, perspective of that, is that there's two different entitlements, service and financial. I mean, so they're. Both are receiving entitlements. I guess it's just a matter of perspective. What's, uh, I don't think I used the word entitlement. Can you tell me what you mean by that? Um, I guess as far as um, what citizens are, are afforded, you know, and, and you talk about the ability to make changes and who can, um, political spending and, and, right. and taxes and things like that. You know, the upper crust can uh, take um, advantage of um, financial entitlements. And, you know, unfortunate as it may be, but the lower is going to take um, advantage of uh, service entitlements. Yeah, and I guess my fear is that, um, what do you, can you give me an example of a service entitlement? Uh, service entitlements, you're talking things of, you know, um, Medicaid, um, food ah. stamps, you know, um, Social Security, health care, um, things right. of that nature that, you know, everybody should be afforded. They're in our inal inalienable rights, I think. Right. 
Well, and I, and I, I guess I would say I... Do you agree that they are rights? I don't agree that uh, those things are rights. I do think that they are essential enablers of the American dream. I think that it's important that we create social structures that allow intergenerational mobility, that allow for the American dream to happen. Regulation of those social structures, you know, that's, um, you know, there's the top 5% is going to be regulating those social structures. So those entitlements and service entitlements especially are essential, you know, for people to survive, unfortunately. So, you know, when you talk about the form, you know, on the foundation of social structures, it, unfortunate as it may be, is that, you know, these up here are creating that structure and, you know, to their benefit. Well, and, and that... I guess what I would say you're right is to participate politically because if you participate politically in our in our system you can elect people to go to the, to government such that you can arrest the inertia of the system I made an argument that there was an inertia in the system towards taking care of special interests at the at the top at the top arrest the inertia. I think that maybe you can slow the inertia, but I don't think that you can arrest the inertia. I really honestly think, you know, if you look, you know, historically speaking from, um, you know, empires to, to governments over a period of time from a historical perspective is that you can't arrest it. You can slow it down and hopefully maybe somewhere along the line you'll have, um, you know, resolution in the form of revolt, hopefully. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that, uh, that you can find examples of some societies where they're, they may be doing it better than we're doing it. Uh, your, your proposition is that the system is broken and needs to be changed. Is that, do I understand you correctly? And, and you're suggesting that, it, that there's nothing wrong with the system, that there's something wrong with the American people, that the American people aren't doing what they're supposed to in order to work within the system. Am I correct? That's right. We're not using the system that we have. And if we did use the system that we have, I think we can, we could, do much better to uh, provide for fair social systems that would take care of, of people at all different economic strata. So you would disagree with her contention that there's a systematic, or something systematically wrong with government in the United States. You That's wouldn't a, agree with that. I, I don't agree, yeah, I do not agree that there's something systematically wrong with government. Part is participation, you know, however, there are uh, flaws and loopholes that benefit um, certainly the upper echelon that, you know, that those at, on the lower end are not able to participate in. So in, just in that alone says that it is flawed. Yeah, and, and um, but I think all of those things can be fixed with participation. That's my, I guess my contention. I'm open to the, to the possibility that I may be wrong. <laughs> it's lost me for certain. Yeah. Quixotic is something that, uh, that uh, but you know, uh, I'm running for Congress, right? So we're going to try to make a difference. So what do you, you just got to try to make a difference where you are, right? Every day. So. Any other questions any, from the audience? I do a lot of uh, political activism work. One of the things that I run into is that many people don't feel a sense of agency, that they have any real voice, that they'll go out and they might vote one way, but they're just one vote. Or they might go and talk to their friends, but they're drowned out by the television set. They might express one view or another view and talk passionately about it, but people go home and they watch TV for six hours a day and are bombarded with all these messages. So how do you propose to, as individuals, help other people kind of drown out the noise of the TV? What kind of messages can we be telling our friends and family yeah. to help them feel like they have more agency? Well, my, you know, my number one value is transparency and accountability. That's, that's, it's listed up there as, as one of those things we can do. But what I specifically believe we can do uh, with our elected officials is make them use the internet so that uh, it's a platform for all of us to provide our input. So right now, take my member of Congress, okay? He's essentially an information broker. 
I don't know how many constituents are writing him letters supporting website, you know, congressional website reform, which is, let's just say that that's my, my, I don't know how many other constituents are asking him for that. So I write my letter, and I, that, that's it. That's all I know. So I, I get it. You can be really frustrated. But if you insist on having them change their websites so that they provide these platforms and the technology is there where, where every constituent can log in with a voter registration number and a secure password and say, I want congressional website reform to allow for visible constituent input on, on major issues. And, and now all of a sudden, we can see on the, con on the congressman's website, gee, there's, there's uh, 300,000 eligible voters in the district, 70,000 people responded to this survey, and 50,000 of them said they wanted this, this reform. Now, if the congressman doesn't do it, that's a pretty strong argument that we're going to replace that we need to replace that congressman in the next election, right? So, my 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 argument is that we need to we need to work within the system that we have now and create this uh, enhance the transparency and accountability in order to make the agency matter. Because there's two things that are going to happen. Let's say you, you can care passionately about uh, you know making sure that orange pomegranates are, are more available to people in Michigan. And, and you might find that nobody else in Michigan cares about that. And so then you, you can, but you can look at that with that knowledge and say, uh, I feel pretty strongly about this, but nobody else cares. That's one state of affairs. The other state of affairs is you go in and you find out that almost everybody else or, or a large number of people in Michigan care about the orange pomegranate thing. And, and once you have that information, that's knowledge is power, right? Then you can make something happen with it. Uh, but I think you have to, we have to make our elected officials give us access to the information that they have. My representative told me, oh yeah, I, I have that information, but he won't display it. You think this transparency needs to be brought about through legislation? No. Just I don't by think it, citizens acting on their own? Just through, through what I'm doing with my representative is, you, you know, I, I've committed that I, I am not going to vote. I have two things. Uh, the, I, I want every uh, elected official to take the votesmart.org political courage test. Votesmart.org is a website, nonpartisan website. Political courage test is kind of a benchmark test. And then the other, uh, the other thing is I want them to do this website reform that allows me as a constituent to go in and see what everybody else in the district has told them about their values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what my personal vow is I'll never again vote for an incumbent who hasn't committed to do those things. Okay? And I went to my representative, finally, it took me like four tries before I actually got to talk to him about these things. And, and he's not going to support him. And so that's why I'm running against him. Because now I don't have to vote for him, I can vote for myself. Right? So. I think that's great. Um... Those are excellent examples of positive behaviors that we can all engage in to become a part of the process instead of sheep. But a lot of people, and I see this more and more and more, um, are very cynical about the entire process. Right. And, you know, very beaten down by a lot of the messages they see on TV. Or, you know, for instance, we watched the Occupy thing happen, and then we watched a lot of um, the assembly rules change. So now there's permits required to peaceably assemble and they can be denied and you know, things like that. Um, we saw a lot of violence and abuse in, in, you know, in this generation. And there wasn't a lot of change that seemed to come out of that, even though we were seeing similar levels of violence that we saw in, during the civil rights movement. And so seeing, comparing those things, but then seeing that the outcomes are very different. In the civil rights movement, we had a lot of amazing changes happen that were needed. 
Um, but you know, during the Occupy movement, talking about the wealth inequality, the the wages um, flattening out from the 1970s and things like that, then I, things I know you're aware of. Um, people see that, you know. People aren't inherently stupid. They see this stuff and they feel cynical. So, how do you go about, you know, when talking to people, um, help them transform that cynicism into a sense of empowerment? Well. I, I don't know that I can, uh, apart from saying that it all starts with, with each person, right? I mean, you have, we all get up every day and we have a choice between being cynical or, or, or not being cynical. Uh, and, and, you know, my choice is not to be and to try to encourage those around me not to be, right? Uh, one of my friends in the Army always used to say, you can't wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time. And, and it's, it's a good folksy way of saying, you just can't give up. You just can't give up. I mean, at some point in 1949, there were people trying to make civil rights happen, and there just wasn't enough, there wasn't enough momentum to make it work. But if they hadn't have been doing what they were doing in 1949 and 1950 and 1954, if Brown versus the Board of Education hadn't happened, then 1963 wouldn't have happened. And then 1964 wouldn't have happened, you know? And, and, and the Civil Rights Act wouldn't have gotten passed. So I, all, all I can say is it's frustrating, it's, but it's not, you know, the thing that I use as my tagline on radio interviews is it's not the republic of me. I have my ideas, and I'm going to be passionate about putting my ideas out there, but it, it's the republic of all of us. And until enough of us get engaged with my ideas, then my ideas aren't going to happen. So I, I, don't know that I'll, I don't know that I can solve the, uh, uh, that I can find any shortcut around getting from 1948 to 1963. You know, you just, we just got to do it. We got to care. <laughs> so thank you for being active. Any other questions from the audience? Any closing comments, Steve? No, thank you guys so much. Thank, thanks a bunch. And if anybody has any, uh, let's see, I think I got a, oh, no, I don't. I thought I had a uh, website up here. But accountabilitycitizenship.org is something that I started uh, last year. And I actually left my job at overstock.com to sort of pursue that a little bit more. And, uh, and also to, to sort of get into this election thing. So, uh, you know, there's, there's people out there that are trying to make a difference. We'll, we'll be able to move stuff down the road. Thanks. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, as well as participating in our Race and Ethnicity Conference for 2014. Uh, of course, tonight's uh, talk concludes that conference. And uh, so thank you for attending tonight and throughout this conference. And uh, thank you for coming.